Welcome back to Hot Mess Espresso, guys. Uh, we have yet another therapist on the podcast. We have Amy Geritana on the... I did it, finally! You did it! You got <laughs> my <laughs> camera five times! <laughs> but we have Amy on the podcast today. Uh, Amy, hi, welcome in. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really of excited course. to be here. Shout out to your hubby for finding me on TikTok and then being like, my, I think fiance at the time, my fiance would like be perfect for this. And I was like, no, bring her on. Like, seriously, send her my crap. Like, we need to do this. He's, like my, he's my biggest cheerleader. He'll be like, it's oh my God, so you cute. With this person and this person and this person. I'm like, where did you find these people? Like, where right. Did you find them? Speaking of finding, I found my phone. I'm sitting on it. Yay. <laughs> it went off and I was like, oh, oh, where's that coming? I was like, okay. But um, yeah, he is, he's adorable. He's your bit. He was just like, oh my God. She, and I was like, send me your stuff. Like, let's do this. So I'm so glad we were finally able to connect and get on and everything months. else. It definitely yeah. took a couple months, but we're here now. So. It, it did. But also like, I took a bunch of time off from filming just because I was burnt out. Cause like, you don't run a mental health podcast without mental health issues. And oh, yeah. I had like six months. I'm still like wrapping up and putting out episodes that I recorded back in March. So oh, wow. that's why it took so long. So yeah, like it's a whole thing and just, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I'm so glad you're finally on. Yeah. So um, I was actually on the phone with one of my uh, really good friends who's a therapist yesterday. And I had said, I'm getting a, uh, I, what is your exact title? Like what? So I'm an LCSW, so I'm a mm -hmm. licensed clinical social worker. And then what I specialize in is eating disorders, um, but I don't have the certification for eating disorder specialist. It's kind of mm. like I ideally at this point could have it because I've been doing it for so long. It requires mm -hmm. more supervision. I've done all the things, and it's kind of like an optional thing yeah. you don't need it to specialize in eating disorders so really my credentials are just an lcsw licensed clinical social worker yeah i'm only asking because i was like i, I was like I, I don't know exactly what she does but i know she works with eating disorders and my friend was literally like there are not enough of her so i'm so excited that she's coming on so, from i guess one mental health professional to another like I know that she's very excited that this episode is going to be coming out and that I was able to like connect with you and all of that stuff. Yeah, definitely. I think like in the eating disorder field, and maybe because I'm just so surrounded by it because all the therapists I know specialize in eating disorders, but the burnout is so real. Like yeah. you were just talking about burnout. It's so real that it's hard to stay in this field specifically eating disorders or working with personality disorders or what honestly any mental health yeah. issue it's hard to not burn out and go i yesterday i was like i want to go missing for six weeks because I'm, <laughs> I'm tired i'm tired so yeah yeah so like it it's nice to have other therapists that can relate but it's yeah there are a lot of us no there's not that many of us but there's good ones and there's bad ones so right what, like, what even got you to the point where you were like, this is what I want to specialize in? So it's really interesting. I fell kind of into this. So prior to working in eating disorders, I had just got like my junior license. So my LSW and I was living in Philly um, and my internship, I was working in substance use, kind of in like a community health center because like I am technically a social worker. So I am in like lower income areas um, a lot. And so I was working in substance use, again, got burned out, kind of just straight up stopped working. Um, and I started looking for a new job and I applied to a part-time job, therapist job at a eating disorder um, intensive outpatient and partial hospitalization program. So like a PHP, IOP, um, program and when I went there they were like oh it's so great you have no eating disorder experience because we want to like mold you and train you in our method yeah it's kind of terrifying kind of cultish <laughs> but like we want you to learn like the ways we deal with eating disorders and at first I like didn't know what that meant I was like I don't I don't know what that means yeah um, but then I went from that eating disorder moved back to Jersey um, started working at another eating disorder clinic in PHP IOP again, 
and it was basically the same but a little different Mm -hmm. so I just kind of was like I actually love this field like it's one of the hardest things I've ever seen ever worked in the hardest like it's just really difficult it's really sad but I'm I can separate myself from like the sadness and the 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 burnout of it most Mm -hmm. times um and it just became something that I became really passionate about helping young girls grown women men like it it affects everyone so it doesn't and that's what I find is so interesting is like I'm not getting one gender. I'm not getting one age. I've been randomly, for example, now getting a lot of like 50, 60 year olds in menopause who all of a sudden are like, I'm really struggling with something that I didn't even know I had. So I love the range of people I work with and it never gets old. And it's always like a mystery because everybody's eating disorder, disordered eating is different. I mean, it's different in every aspect. So it, it keeps it, it keeps me on my toes. That's for sure. And that's kind of why it was like, I want to stay in this, this field. Yeah. I want to circle back to something you just said, because, um, you had said that you have clients that are saying, I didn't even know I had it. Cause I, I, I know for me, I mean, I grew up in 2000s diet culture and we'll we'll touch on that in a minute but yeah <laughs> it's real bad. it was a great time said literally no one ever um but I I literally so when you're saying like didn't even know because I think for me I just know that there's no of two eating disor- disorders and that's anorexia and bulimia I, update my knowledge on it basically are there more eating disorders is it more broad is it like less like tell me all the things because i'm not i'm not well versed on this yeah you know i like literally have like a powerpoint that i present to people that's on different types of eating disorders because you're Mm -hmm. right like there is i'm kind of like scrolling through it right now but there is anorexia and bulimia which is like your stereotypical eating disorder Mm -hmm. where like someone's either purging or they're restricting where it's like no they can actually go hand in hand and there's also actually a newer diagnosis which is newer to like the dsm which Mm -hmm. we have our problems with but um (laughs) everyone's got their problems with the dsm (laughs) yeah it's which is holding up my computer right now um you love it like (laughs) avoidant restrictive food intake disorder which is okay um And basically, I mean, I'm generalizing here, just to keep it brief, but it has a lot to do with texture of food, um, lack of interest in food, fear of negative consequences. So like maybe act like choking or throwing up, um, a lot of like picky eating, being very particular about the color, the smell, and just complaints that like it causes bodily discomfort without any cause. And so this is kind of like a newer diagnosis that you also see a lot of times with people who have sensory issues. Um, I was just going to ask you that. Do you find, because the second you said texture, my brain was like neurodivergent clients. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really hard. I mean, all eating disorders are extremely hard to treat, but because this one's newer, there's such less research on it. Right. Um, And a lot of it is just being like, here, let's do some exposure therapy. Let's try this food over and over and over till we find like, you're okay with it. I mean, obviously Mm -hmm. that made it sound really like torture, but. I was gonna say that sounds more traumatizing than. Yeah. Okay. Not not that bad, but you can't just stick to like five foods. I mean, you can Mm -hmm. if you really want, but there's so much more out there. You're not getting nutritional value if you're only eating. It's usually carbs. Generalizing. It's usually carbs. Um, You can't just eat carbs you need to eat protein and like vegetables and stuff like that so I mean that's one of Mm -hmm. the many eating disorders but then there's binge eating disorder um just like binge eating eating a lot really quickly in a short period of time people kind of like black out sometimes during this period eating like to the point of discomfort like just if you look at it as, as like a hunger scale one being starving ten being uncomfortable, nauseous from eating too much. It's usually on that eight, nine, 10 scale. Okay. Like 
and usually it's associated with a lot of like guilt, shame, hiding of food, all that. And then there's, I mean, I could keep going, but there's OSFED too, which is other specified eating or feeding or eating disorders, which is like okay. anorexia atypical because you technically aren't underweight, um, which again, mm -hmm. there's a lot of issues with that. But one that like I do want to bring up really briefly is orthorexia because it's not in our wonderful DSM. Um, I've never heard of it. You're going to know. When I say it, you're going to be like, oh, I know what you're that. talking about. <laughs> that. It's just kind of like this preoccupation with healthy food. And I put healthy in quotes because really what is healthy food? Um, right. So it's not a formal diagnosis and it's often promoted very often promoted by doctors, weight loss programs, and sometimes dietitians. I mean, dietitians are God sent, um, but sometimes by dietitians. So mm -hmm. like checking ingredients, checking nutritional labels, which we all do to an extent, but this mm -hmm. is taking it to the next level where basically it's all you can think about. This right. Like, compulsion this occupation okay. with what i'm putting in my body and how healthy it is so it's not technically a diagnosis yet but i i, th I think we're getting there yeah because i yeah i can see how that's that's a thing especially with obviously like the early 2000s with all of the you know the atkins diet the this diet the that diet and that can i feel like that can kind of develop from all of these different diet fads over the years definitely i mean if you think about now with like keto and Ugh. i don't know why that's the only diet coming to mind but even like these weight loss injectables you go to the doctors and you say like oh i want to lose weight they're like well eat healthier and then it's like okay well what does that mean and then you start yeah to fixate on it if you think about any diet i mean it's the same it's the same thing atkins like you're cutting out what carbs I think um, so, yeah. These things that we don't have anything, any research to back up is healthy for us to do. What is it really affecting in the long run? So, I mean, yes, I think it very much comes from diet culture and what we see, especially when you talk about the early 2000s and like heroin chic. Like, no problem. Just starve yourself. You'll be fine. Mm. Dude, I, I like those low rise jeans. I was, I was just thinking about that. It's like a quarter of an inch above your pubic bone. And I'm just like, you, like, if you can't see your hip bones, you're not skinny enough. And it's like, what? Yeah. But when, even what, like, I go back and sometimes I just like watch movies from like the early 2000s, like those like teen movies, like, and I'm like, this is no wonder we had and had such a both like haven't had such a problem with like our bodies growing up I would leave the movie theater and I'd be like okay I want to look like that person in that movie like yeah. I want to be that I want their body type I'm 5'1 I'm never going to look like these people who are 5'9 five, 5'10 five, it's not realistic yeah. but there was no one telling me like you can't be that and I think that's I was I'm very thankful I did not develop into getting an eating disorder, but I can understand why it would be so easy to fall into like restrictive eating or purging, yeah. binge eating when this is what we're seeing all around us until, I mean, until today. Yeah. I mean, case in point, like early 2000s movies, the thing that just came to mind was, what was that movie with Hayden? Uh, Panettiere and um Michelle it was the the ice princess one or whatever the ice skating like girly film but there was this scene where the ice skaters are ordering a salad and she's like and a quarter cup of cheese and it's like they were giving her crap for ordering cheese because cheese makes you fat and I'm just over here like this is what we all watched as kids like that came out I was like in high school so but then it was like the books and it was like you can only have like 20 grams of fat a day otherwise like you're never gonna burn it off and you know it was just this constant 
stuff with food and it's you know it was chicken plain rice and a vegetable and that's really all you should eat which sounds miserable it, it is i think yeah. i had an old like personal trainer that literally said um abs are created on broccoli and sadness and i'm just like i don't want abs enough <laughs> Yeah, I don't want abs enough to like just, but that's also like another issue is this lack of variety that we get ourselves into, Mm -hmm. especially when we're dealing with eating disorders or just disordered eating. It doesn't really have to be an eating disorder either, or just body image issues. It's like we become so restrictive and we stick to things like broccoli and chicken. Like what joy is that bringing you, man? Like, I know it's not, and it's not your fault. It's not your fault because this is what you're told. Like I had a personal trainer too, and all he ate was like, this was not that long ago. All he ate was ground beef, and that's it. And I was like, I mean, he wasn't, he like didn't have the nutritional, like, background I feel like they should have. Yeah. Um, but I was like, you know, I'm an eating disorder therapist, and what you're saying is really concerning to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I probably shouldn't have said that because he was a little embarrassed. And Maybe it was like a little shaming, but yeah, I mean, it, it's really interesting what people like to throw at us. Yeah. I just like, thankfully, um, my form, my like just recently former personal trainer really over the last like four years has helped fix my relationship with food where I can have like a few handfuls of chips and I'm just not like well now you got to eat like super clean for the rest of the week because you just had junk like and I think the thing with diet culture too and I I'm sure you deal with this I mean correct me if I'm wrong do uh, does a lot of what you're dealing with with eating disorders like I know that a lot of it is psychological and blah 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 but are you finding that a lot of your clients like your younger clients are not only the media, but like their own families started to affect like that. Yeah, that's a huge part. I mean, there is obviously it's a mental health disorder. So there's mm-hmm. a big part of it being a mental health disorder. But there's also so much more that goes into into it. I mean, there's genetics. I mean, mm-hmm. I've seen people whose parents had eating disorders and then never spoken about and all of a sudden their kid develops an eating disorder and the kid didn't even know the parent had that so there's a genetic component Mm -hmm. there's a biological component and there's a huge environmental component and i think parents because also if you think about generations like they were also past generations of like you got to eat a certain way you have to look a certain way like you have to eat healthy and no junk food and like junk food's not even a word I use in sessions because I'm totally against like labeling food like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's a lot of reteaching parents how to talk about food and like, there's no healthy, there's no unhealthy. Like we can make all foods fit into our diet. And by diet, I just mean what we eat. Um, Like we can make all foods fit. Mm -hmm. Or I have clients who, who are older and their parents were like in the Holocaust. And it was all about saving food, eating everything on your plate because they suffered. Mm -hmm. So then they pass that generational trauma down in the form of food, which like when I first worked with a client, it was the most fascinating. I mean, it was fascinating to me. Like, wow, that would not cross my mind that like if you grew up in like communist Poland or something like. Right. save your food, save your food. You have to eat everything on your plate. And then that even is an issue because if you're eating past your hunger cues and your hunger fullness level, then you lose that like skill of listening to your fullness. So when I said the scale of like one to 10 earlier, how are you supposed to know how you're feeling? If you're full, if you're hungry, if you are not listening to your body and you're basically being told, don't listen to your body. And like trauma is trauma. That's not their fault. They dealt with trauma, but the environmental factor and like the parent factor is huge. And not even parents, friends, friends too. 
Yep. Like college. Like it's all, it's everywhere. It, it's everywhere. it really is. And it's like, we're constantly, I mean, I know it's a ton with men, but like as, as a woman, I feel like we're constantly being compared because it went from, like you said, heroin chic in the early 2000s to now, oh, you need to have all the curves, all the curves. And if you don't have curves, like, ugh. And it's like, what if I'm neither? Yeah. <laughs> like, what do you guys want from me? I know. Like, I'm sorry. I cannot magically, like, create that, like, Kim Kardashian unrealistic, mm-hmm. you know, th- when the waist trainers came out. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. That was yeah. a thing. I'm like, I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to, like, squish your intestines like that. No, but and there's okay. so much to back up. Like, hey, guys, it's, like, not something you should be doing. Like, here are some x-rays of people's bodies after you squish their organs yeah. with, like, waist trainers. So, but I knew you were going to say Kim Kardashian because that has become what the ideal body looks like mm-hmm. right now. It's the trend now. Yeah. I feel like it is starting to fade back into that heroin chic because I know they started coming out with low-rise jeans again. Because- I... Literally, this is going to sound ridiculous, but I got a little, like, anxiety triggered when I saw Low Rise was coming back. I'm like, I didn't have, like, the flat stomach then, and I sure as hell don't have it now. So give me my mid-rise and high-rise, and shh. Yeah. Yep. Let's burn them all. Like, I I totally agree. They're not even comfortable. No, they're not. I literally feel like I'm just hiking them up because they just, like, keep falling. I'm like, no, I kind of need, like, my little bit of a soft belly to, like, hold them up. That's, like, the whole point. That's <laughs> that is the whole point. Yeah. I'm just like, totally why right. is this a thing? But, like, speaking of generational trauma, um, I'm saying this because, like, I know of, like, a story. But, like, can trauma trigger a disorder, like, an eating disorder? Yeah. I mean, I don't see why not. I think like when it comes to eating disorders, what's really tricky is like we know so little and know so much at the same time. So Mm -hmm. something like if you experience like sexual trauma at an early age, that can absolutely affect you and you cope through food. I have clients in the past who binge eat because that's how they cope with past experiences that they had. Um, or they don't want to look or feel attractive because that will give unwanted attention, which then triggers trauma. So they will binge eat to avoid any unwanted attention, which like is a really tough thing to hear. That, like, That's heartbreaking. Ooh, it is. It really is. And like, I mean, vice versa, it doesn't just have to be binge eating. It can be- right restricting but I feel like a lot of times with the binge eating often comes that emotional component where a lot of times I mean this 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 is not based in any scientific thing but like often with what I've noticed with restriction it's often about control and binging is that sense of lack of control so it's kind of how it ties into just like trauma in general But what I've seen is like a lot of clients I've worked with don't just have an eating disorder. The end, shut the book. Cool. Awesome. Let's, let's deal with it. It's, there's trauma. There's, I've seen a lot of personality disorders. A lot of like borderline personality disorder comes with um, eating disorders, depression, anxiety. Like it's not just one. There's the comorbidity Uh aspect of it is so so strong i don't know anyone that's just like all right i'm i'm anorexic and that's nothing else is wrong yeah nothing else is wrong no not at all it's just this like no there's there's probably more going on yeah it's uh interesting that you brought up the personality disorders with the eating disorders because like right before we started recording i was kind of like thinking and you'd mentioned that it's, you know, you have your good days and your bad days when it comes to like therapy and stuff. And I was kind of just like making the correlation of that's how a lot of therapists feel about borderline patients that, you know, it's, you know, you feel like you're making progress and all of a sudden they're like, they flip on a switch and stuff like that. So 
Um, did you, I'm like trying to figure out how I want to word this. Like, have you dealt with multiple clients that had the comorbidity of BPD and, and like, how do you, how do you separate the two or are you able to separate the two while you're treating? Because obviously like they're two very, they're together, but they're two very separate treatment plans. So how do you, how's your brain wrap around all of that? I mean, it's tricky. I think like there's a lot of stigma when it comes to BPD and personality disorders Mm -hmm. and how difficult clients are. But I like, I love it. Like for a while, like on my psychology today page, I had personality disorders and eating disorders as like my top two things that I treated just because they were so common. And while they're different diagnoses, they overlap a lot. And the way that I have found is most effective, and this is what I learned from working in treatment centers, is using like dialectical behavioral therapy, so yep. DBT. Um working on the distress tolerance skills. So learning to manage distress and discomfort, working on the like interpersonal skills that a lot of times comes with like the BPD. The distress also comes from like the BPD and the eating disorder. So Mm -hmm. I have found that DBT has been really effective, especially because Marsha Linehan, who developed this program, she had... BPD herself. Um, And it's something that they've developed into the programs a lot. Like most treatment centers right now will do DBT. And I don't know if it's, they were like, hey, we're getting a lot of borderline patients. I doubt they were thinking like that. Right. But a lot of the treatment does overlap and it is really interesting to see. So you can work on the distress and you can work on setting boundaries and deal and like the mindfulness aspect, like the coping skills, they all do overlap and you can make it work for either diagnosis. Right. So. It's very interesting. Cause I, I was kind of like just basically making a hypothesis and throwing it at the wall. I didn't realize that there was that much intertwined. Mm-hmm. Like I wish I had like a statistic to throw at you. And I probably should have looked it up before, but just from personal experience, I I have seen that overlap. Yeah. I mean, from personal experience, I definitely have struggled with my relationship with food. It was never like a full-blown eating disorder, mm-hmm. but it definitely was not the best relationship. And I definitely, there was a lot of the shame and the guilt and, you know, I would eat my feelings and, you know, that was... To me, I was justifying it by being like, well, this could be like a drug problem. I could be out at the bars right now, you know, that kind of thing. And it was still just like a really unhealthy coping mechanism that, yeah, through therapy, through DBT and stuff like that. And then through just like my trainer definitely working with me on on doing a lot of like what I thought a relationship with food was supposed to be. It definitely – it definitely – worked its way. So it's really interesting um, that there is that like more consistent comorbidity with it. Mm-hmm. It definitely is. Um, I figure out how to word this. It's tricky. Cause, like, it you is. Don't wanna, like say something like offensive and you don't want to like, word something wrong. But it's literally just me like asking the questions that I know. Cause I have, I have friends that I'll be like, okay, I have this guest coming on. Like, what are, what are things you want to know? Like, you know, that kind of thing. So we kind of, because I want to make sure that I'm kind of getting a consensus Mm -hmm. with all this stuff. Yeah. But, um, do you find that you have like more super long-term patients or like, is it kind of like a bittersweet day when someone like graduates therapy? It's, Definitely bittersweet. And I think this like really, this is a really interesting question because it brings up the idea of you recovering or Mm -hmm. like, are you recovered or are you forever in recovery? And Mm -hmm. this is such a debate between therapists, between just like the eating disorder community. Do you recover in the end or are you forever the rest of your life in recovery? And I let my I let my patient or my clients choose that. 
and like I let them decide what is best for them. So, I mean, it's a great moment when you see someone kind of graduate, terminate treatment. I don't know why therapists use the term terminate because it's so aggressive, but like when you literally, <laughs> yeah, we say like terminate treatment. Um, but when you terminate treatment or you graduate like therapy, I guess maybe because you can never really graduate therapy. It's always effective. Um, it is bittersweet. It's definitely bittersweet, but it's so awesome to see someone who struggled so much and it kind of put this pause on their life to go out and like enjoy food and like hang out with friends. Like eating disorders are so isolating. If you're struggling with food, okay, so you avoid social situations where there's food. Everything huh. has food. Right. Everything. Literally. Like, if you go to the movies, there's literally ads for like popcorn and sodas and like snacks on the big screen while you're waiting for the movie to start. You can't mm -hmm. avoid it. You can't avoid the cultural aspect of it. Food brings a lot of people together. So you're yeah. going to avoid family as well. I don't know how I got on this tangent, but. It's, it's a good tangent. <laughs> it is a good tangent. But yeah, like, so there is this idea of like, I do have a lot of long-term patients and I, when I was working in the treatment center, we would see people come through a few times, a few to a lot of times, mm -hmm. like the one and done people, awesome, amazing, but it, it, it does seem to take a lot longer than just one stint in a four week to six week program. Yeah. Um, to recover from a lifelong thing that you see everywhere. I mean, again, it's everywhere. Diet culture is everywhere. TikTok exists now. Social media is a big thing. So there are, we're throwing more stuff at, you're getting more stuff thrown at you too, um, which I think really affects it. But I mean, the long-term clients, even if they're doing really, like when they're doing really well, now we can work on the other stuff, like the depression, like the anxiety those things don't just disappear. Right. Um, so even though you've dealt with the distress around food or emotional eating or whatever, I hate the term emotional eating. I don't know why, but I hate it. That's... Like you still have other issues to deal with. And like, even mm -hmm. if it's just family relationships, like there's other things to work on. So my patients do tend to patients, clients, they tend to stay long-term. And by long-term, yeah. I've, I've had the same outpatient clients five years now six years yeah um, and even if we're not working on recovery it comes up every every now and then yeah I, I mean I've been in therapy basically on and off for seven years you just every time you think you're done unpacking you're not you, you're not mm -hmm. or something like current happens and you're triggered and you're like I know these coping mechanisms but like and you go back to therapy, so, like, I have a third party, like, reminding – or a second party, really. But somebody else – so, that was – I mean, you kind of – you kind of answered that already, but I guess I'll just, like, ask it a little more pointedly. Like, um, do you have clients that, like, will call and be like, hey, I know it's been, like, a year, but I'm struggling with XYZ. Like, I need to come back for – even if it's, like, two months of sessions or just, like, a session or two, like – do you get those sometimes just because like, I feel like with mental health, like you're, you're never, I fully believe in the whole, you're in constant recovery, especially when there's like trauma and other things involved. So like, do you get your, your clients that come back and you're, they're just like, so this happened. I didn't realize we needed to unpack this. Like, can we unpack it in the next like month or so kind of thing? I, I definitely get the clients who come back after like a year two months, three months, they're doing well. And all of a sudden they're like, I need to see you again. And I'm like, all right, let's, let's freaking do this. Um, and it's not usually, I don't usually have like, I've never dealt with the situation where it was like, let's do two months of therapy. Well, let's I'm just see. saying like, they're yeah. like, oh, it'll just be like quick. <laughs> it's never, it's never, no, it's never quick. <laughs> it's never quick I, because then you unpack things and then you like discover a little bit more. Yeah. And, and then, something current happens and you're like, oh, well, let me unpack that. But it's yeah. like my favorite part of being a therapist is just having clients. I mean, 
having clients come back and know that this is a space that they can use yep. when they need to. If it's even if it's a text at like 12 at night that I answer the next day because, you know, boundaries and stuff. But like mm-hmm. to be like, hey, I know we haven't talked in three months, but like, can we set up an appointment? And I'm like, hell yeah. Like, absolutely. Yeah. Let's do the work. Like, I'm so proud of you for coming back when yeah. things got hard and like utilizing the supports around you is like the best feeling because that means that they took what they learned in therapy about using your supports and actually utilize their supports. And yeah. so it's a, it's a great feeling, not that they have bad stuff happening, but that they can come back and utilize what they learned. Yeah. Cause I think there's that, I don't want to say stigma. I'm like trying to think of the right word, but there's that like thought process that once, once you leave therapy, like, it's it's almost like you didn't learn anything if you go back and it's like no that is the one thing I did learn is that I need you know I have gotten to a point where I can't handle this on my own I need to go back and like either reinforce a coping skill that like I learned a year ago that I don't really remember how to use it or you know there's constantly new developments in treatment for everything you know or something happened that triggered, you know, this thing and I thought I was over it and I'm not. So like, let's talk it through again, you know, that kind of thing. So I think with therapy, it's more of a revolving door than like, you know, one side of the fence or the other, for sure. Definitely. Definitely. And I think like, I mean, I could go on a rant about this for ages, but I mean, insurance, when you're developing a treatment Ugh. plan, for example, yeah. When you're developing a treatment insurance, I'm just like, oh god, I I had a, I had a therapist on talking about insurance, and everyone's like, I totally get it now. Fuck it, still, but I totally get it now, and I'm like, yeah, no, it it no, opened up a lot of people's eyes as to why therapists take certain insurances and stuff, but like at the same time, like, fuck you. Oh yeah, totally. Like, the insurance, not the, the therapist. It, no, it's the worst, and so they decide like you get three months, like when I work in treatment centers, you get three months of treatment, you get 60 days, 40 days, 45 days, 30 days of partial hospitalization. That's what you get. And I've argued with the insurance doctors over the phone, like, bro, no, I obviously didn't say bro, but like, bro, no, they need more time. And they're like, no. And I'm like, are you, do you even specialize in eating disorders? And they're like, no. I'm like, what do you oh, no. specialize in? Like cutting corners? Because I'm pretty sure that's all you've said. I, it, the things that these like insurance doctors will come and I get that their whole point is to like save the company money. But at the same time, are you kidding me? It's, it's not medically necessary. Says who? You're just looking at things on paper. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's so They're annoying. looking at things on paper. They're looking at specifically with eating disorders. They're looking at weight. And that's it. They're looking at people's BMI being like, yeah, I mean, BMI is like a whole different podcast episode. Yeah. I'm still like technically overweight on my BMI and I'm five foot in a size two. So explain that one to me. Exactly. Like, excuse you? It's complete shenanigans, but that's Mm -hmm. that's what they're looking at. So they're not looking at like, oh, hey, this person's like especially when you see someone in a bigger body or someone who is considered fat, like who has anorexia, that's a wild situation that insurance does not want to cover because you can be in a bigger body and still have anorexia and still be restricting. But you know, like your BMI says you're not like you're obese, which is a word we don't use in the community, but like you're obese. So you don't need treatment. And then you're just, throwing these people by the wayside yeah it's i hate it here i mean again this could, <laughs> this could this be a, a whole, whole other, other episode <laughs> yeah it totally could be but but yeah i know we're just like let's just let's sit with that for a minute let's just like <laughs> let's take a moment of silence because what the fuck like mm-hmm. i just heard that and my brain just went huh Because logically, it doesn't make sense. But, you know, to corporate, it's totally logical. And, you know, oh, God. I just... It's a money-making operation. Yeah. It's gross. It is gross. It's so gross. Makes me feel icky. So, I guess to, like, 
wrap up, I don't want to say what's next for you, but like what, what are some things that like you're looking forward to in your therapy career and, you know, moving forward with clients and stuff like that? Yeah. So I think it was two year, a year ago, I opened a, like an in-person office. Um, yeah. In the town where I was living, I no longer live in that town, but I still have my office. Um, and I think like the next path that I'm going to take, and I was thinking about this actually this week was I do have a lot, we were talking about comorbidity. I have a mm-hmm. lot, lot of clients who also have like OCD. Um, and I know from like, just, ethically, that is not something that I feel comfortable treating. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of next in my journey of is taking a course taking because therapists always, like you said earlier, there's always new developments, there's always new theories, there's always new like treatment styles, techniques, coping skills, like it's forever developing. It's a pretty new science. Um, Right. So I think that's kind of where my journey is taking me next is to learn more about OCD beyond the basics so that I can better assist my clients who are struggling with like OCD. Because again, like we said, with BPD, it is very, another very common disorder. No, it's, it's just to kind of reflect on that a little bit. My, I have ADHD, so like my brain always like makes these like, pew 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 thing mm-hmm. kind of things and when you had said like um texture like hyper fixation on certain things and I was like I want I hadn't I like didn't know how to bring it up but I was like thinking like I wonder if OCD is also a com- comorbidity because some of these sound like true OCD not a type a personality people oh my god <laughs> no, that that's a whole other thing it's like you don't have ocd you're just anal retentive but <laughs> you know so it's interesting that you bring that up but yeah i think that's that's i love to see where therapy goes where you know the comorbidities all of that so thank you again for taking the time out and coming on because i've learned so much just from this. I'm so glad. Good. I'm glad. I mean, that's the whole point is to like teach others. Like you said in the beginning, like I know two diagnoses, like I know anorexia, I know Mm -hmm. bulimia, but to like, I just want to like shake everyone and be like, listen, there's more. (laughs) It's like (laughs) the worst infomercial ever. (laughs) (laughs) And now for $9.99, you can also have orthorexia. Um, (laughs) But I mean, like, you also have to find humor in it because there's you no, you can't survive without humor. And most of my patients or clients, I don't know why I keep saying patients. I never say patients, but most of my clients can find humor or I help them find humor because you will not make it in this world if you cannot, like, make fun of yourself or just make fun of the situation. Make jokes. Yeah. Just make jokes about the situation. It's oh, the only sure. way to make it through. So. I really appreciate you also taking time out of your day to chat. Oh, of with course, me. this is so your new fun. tattoo. I can't wait till you like announce it to the. I audience. know, I know. That'll be this weekend. So, if if you're like people can basically timestamp when this was recorded now Sorry, because they're bad. gonna be they're no, it's totally fine. I literally had said that I have like I, at the beginning. I think I said it either in the first record or this record, but um, I said like I've got like I'm still pulling out of her putting out episodes that are like six months old so it's just you know that kind of thing but yeah no I'm just like if you really want to like figure out when this was like go to my Instagram and like figure out when I post this versus like when this actually comes out (laughs) so we're just we're just hot messes over here we're just staying on brand that's all it's fine that's all so but Amy I oh god this has been so educational and so informative and I'm out of big words, but this has been great. So thank you so much for having. Absolutely. Enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy your weekend. It's a weekend. Enjoy your weekend. Go do fun things. All right.